In October 1916, as World War I raged on, the children of Tsar Nicholas II of Russia visited him at his military headquarters. The family seemed happy and carefree despite the long years of war and internal strife. Within six months, the whole dynasty would be swept away in the tumult of revolution. Born a German, the Empress was widely, but wrongly, believed to be a German spy. Hatred for her was fueling the fires of discontent. In the capital, Petrograd, revolution was brewing. From their home, the Alexander Palace outside Petrograd, Alexandra wrote to Nicholas daily, even hourly. Nicholas returned home from the front for Christmas and the new year of 1917. More than ever before, this naturally private family withdrew into their own world. But some of those closest to the family wrote about it, such as Lily Dane, the Empress's confidante. Every Thursday evening, a small Romanian orchestra played in the red drawing room. The Empress sat by the fire, staring into the glowing embers. She seemed unusually sad. I whispered anxiously, Oh, Madame, why are you so sad tonight? The Empress turned and looked at me. Why am I sad, Lily? I can't say, really. I think my heart is breaking. Not only her heart, the Romanov Empire itself was about to crumble. There was talk in the streets and drums everywhere. People were saying that all our troubles come from the Tsar's court. The Tsarina is a German, so she's a traitor. In Petrograd, rumor ruled. Alexandra was a spy. She was giving Nicholas drugs. He was permanently drunk. The relatives were desperate. The Tsar's brother-in-law, Grand Duke Alexander, came to plead with Nicholas on behalf of the whole dynasty. For the first time in history, a revolution is being engineered not from below, but from above. Not by the people against their government, but by the government against the welfare of the people. The man who would eventually emerge as the Russian people's revolutionary hero was still in exile. Lenin greeted the new year of 1917 in Europe, where he addressed a group of Swiss workers. The hall was practically empty, and Lenin, drawing his conclusions at the end of his speech, said, there are revolutionary currents in Europe, but I think a socialist revolution is still a long way off. We old boys won't live to see it. You young men will, but we won't. He didn't know that in less than three months, three months, in his own country, there would be a revolution. As Lenin continued to try to build his tiny Bolshevik party in Europe, in Petrograd, the strikes and protests were multiplying daily. The weather made it worse. In February, 1,200 locomotive engines froze and burst. Food and fuel could not be transported. In Petrograd, hunger sharpened the people's anger. Crowds in the capital broke into food shops and helped themselves. 
The next morning, when I went to school, I saw the destroyed bread shop. The sign was torn off, the door was hanging just on one hinge, windows were broken, everything was turned upside down, there were papers everywhere. By Saturday, even the traditionally loyal Cossacks were assuring the demonstrators that they would not use their guns or whips. Revolution was imminent. Alexandra wrote despairingly to Nicholas on the very eve of the Russian Revolution, Sunday the 11th of March, the 24th of February by the old Russian calendar. Yesterday there were rows on the Nevsky Prospect because the poor people stormed the bread shops. They ransacked one shop completely. The Tsar cabled his response to his frantic ministers. I command that the disorders in the capital, intolerable during these difficult times of war with Germany, be ended tomorrow. In the very square where Nicholas had unveiled a statue to his father years before, the revolution, brewing for days now, broke out. We saw two dead horses lying across the street and all the um, signs, the imperial signs on the shop were being taken down and many of them already lying on the street. It's a revolution, they said. Coats of arms on gates and railings, the two-headed eagle, which was the symbol of autocracy. People began to tear them down and smash them. My younger sister Katya didn't like it at all. She was about seven or eight and had, was determined to become a social hostess and you give parties and balls. I said, well, now what now? There won't be any society. I won't be able to be a social hostess anymore. The Russia of labor was marching towards power without suspecting it. The Russia of the ruling class had lost without realizing it. So wrote Alexander Kerensky, who was to become one of the leaders of the new provisional government. I saw soldiers surrounded by civilians lining up on the opposite side of the street. They wanted to know what we intended to do with the members of the Tsar's family, and they demanded harsh treatment for them. I said that the most dangerous of them would be kept in custody but that under no circumstances was the crowd to take the law into its own hands. I insisted that bloodshed be avoided. Isolated from the capital, the Empress Alexandra's main concern was that four of her children had developed measles. In those days, a serious disease. My own angel love, well, now Olga and Alexei have the measles. Olga's face all covered, and baby more in the mouth, and coughs very much, and eyes ache. In the palace, Alexandra stayed up all night to greet her husband, now on his way back to his family and capital. But he did not arrive. Lily Den remembered the anxious hours. The Empress was told he had been delayed. Perhaps the blizzard detains him, she said and lay back on her couch. Anastasia was instantly alarmed and turned to me. But Lily, the train is never late. Oh, if only Papa would come quickly. But Papa was trapped. With revolutionary troops blocking the railway lines, the Tsar's only option seemed to be to head for the small town of Pskov where loyal troops were said to remain.
On Wednesday, the 14th of March, the Imperial train slipped into a siding outside Pskov. Nicholas appealed to his generals for support, in vain. The weakened Nicholas would have to go. It was time to pass on the throne. The most bitter words came from Nicholas's uncle Nikolai, whom the Tsar had removed as head of the army. As a loyal subject, I consider it my duty to beg you, Your Majesty, on my knees to save Russia and your heir. Cross yourself and pass the throne to your son. There is no other way out. Grand Duke Nikolai could not quite bring himself to say the word, abdicate. On March the 2nd, 1917, Alexander Guchkov and Vasily Shulgin, representatives of the provisional government, arrived in Pskov to receive Nicholas II's abdication. This film of Shulgin describing his audience with the Tsar was made by the Soviets four years after Stalin's death to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the revolution. It was never broadcast as it was deemed pro-monarchy. На этом месте, где вы сейчас, стоял высокий старик, был министр двора, граф Фредерикс. Он сказал, государь-император сейчас выйдет. Я подумал, значит, это все-таки будет. Судьбы отвратить нельзя. Государь вышел отсюда. Он был в серой черкеске. Мы поклонились. Он подошел к нам, подал руку. И затем жестом пригласил нас сесть. Стал говорить Гучков. Он волновался. Он очень волновался. И не мзырено. Он говорил о том, что происходит в Петрограде. Он говорил о взбунтовавшихся полках. Он говорил о казаках, отказавшихся стрелять. Он говорил о манифестациях, рабочих, о баррикадах на Невском. Наконец он говорил о правительстве, которого не было. Я прибавил. Петербург – это сумасшедший дом. Государь слушал нас, опершись головой, а шел в стену. На его лице... Можно было прочесть разве то, что это длинная речь лишняя. Гучков пришел к тому, что при создавшихся обстоятельствах единственным выходом из положения может быть отречение от престола. Голос царя звучал просто и точно. Выдавал его волнение разве акцент немножко чужой, гвардейский. Я принял решение отречься от престола. До трех часов дня 
Я думал отречься в пользу сына Алексея. С этого времени я переменил решение в пользу брата Михаила. Надеюсь, вы поймете чувство отца. Я понял, государя, как вы знаете, республик болел болезнью неизлечимой и царства не мог. The representatives handed Nicholas the document of abdication to sign, which was composed by the provisional government. Nicholas took it and withdrew to his room. When he returned, he gave them a document with the text of the abdication that he had composed himself. The document of abdication was as follows. In these days of great struggle with an external enemy, who has tried to enslave our country for nearly three years. The Lord God saw fit to send down upon Russia a harsh new ordeal. The developing internal popular disturbances threatened to have a catastrophic effect upon the future conduct of the relentless war. The fate of Russia, the honour of our heroic army, the good of the people. The whole future of our dear fatherland demand that the war be brought to a victorious end, no matter what. A cruel enemy is summoning his last strength, and the hour is near when our valiant army, together with our renowned allies, can completely smash the enemy. During these decisive days for the life of Russia, we considered it a duty of conscience to facilitate our people's close unity and the rallying of all popular forces in order to achieve victory as quickly as possible. And in agreement with the State Duma, we consider it to be for the good to abdicate from the throne of the Russian state and to surrender supreme power. Not wishing to part with our beloved son, we name as our successor our brother, Grand Duke Mikhail Alexandrovich, and bless his assumption to the throne of the Russian state. We entrust our brother to conduct state affairs in complete and unshakable unity with the representatives of the people in the legislative institutions according to principles they will determine, and on this to take an inviolable oath. In the name of our deeply beloved homeland, we call all faithful sons of the fatherland to fulfil their holy duty to this land in obedience to the Tsar in this difficult moment of national trials, and to help him, together with the representatives of the people, to lead the Russian state along the path of victory, prosperity and glory. May the Lord God help Russia. Nicholas The lordly courtesy and fervent patriotism that characterised every line of the text evoked wonder even from the enemies of the Tsar. For the sake of Russia, I decided to take this step. All around me I see treason, cowardice and deceit. Alexandra had no way of knowing that her husband had lost the throne. My own beloved precious angel, light of my life, my heart breaks thinking of you all alone, going through all this anguish, anxiety, and we know nothing of you, nor you of us. 
To protect his invalid son, Alexei, Nicholas had insisted on abdicating in favor of his brother, Grand Duke Michael. Back at the Duma, Shulgin and Guchkov duly reported on their historic mission. The soldiers gathered and questioned them about how the Tsar had abdicated his throne. I abdicate in favor of Grand Duke Michael. Why not Alexei? No, he said, my son is ill. I'm not going to give him up. My grandfather, when he heard that the Tsar abdicated not only uh, for himself, but also for his son, Alexis, he became pale like snow and started having tears and even sobbed and said, well, now Russia is finished. Just like that. No one saw the once imperial family as a priority. Alexandra did not learn of her husband's abdication until the next day. In the palace, both water and electricity had been cut off. And not only had her adored Nikki been forced to abdicate, but also his brother Michael had rejected the throne. Now there was no czar at all. The tutor, Pierre Gilliard, spoke to his student, the former heir Alexei, about the terrible turn of events. You know, your father does not want to be Tsar anymore, Alexei. He looked at me in astonishment, trying to read in my face what had happened. What do you mean? Why? Who's going to be Tsar then? I don't know. Perhaps nobody now. There was a silence, and then he said, but if there isn't a Tsar, Who's going to rule Russia? By the time Nicholas returned home, the Alexander Palace was in the hands of the Revolutionary Guards. No one was present when the ex -Zar met his wife, Alexandra. They themselves never wrote about it. It was said by the courtiers that Nicholas sank into his wife's arms and wept. Sometime afterward, Ludmila Krasina and her sisters walked past the palace, which was now patrolled by revolutionary guards. And one of these men, dressed in khaki, and he looked like a soldier, was shoveling the snow away from the footpaths. I looked and I thought, this is not a soldier, this is the Tsar himself cleaning the paths of his garden. What is he doing, mademoiselle? I asked. He can't be the Tsar. Yes, she said. You see, he's been deposed. It's the revolution. He's a prisoner in his own palace, and he's not allowed to go out. He is guarded. And he's doing this to get some exercise. What amazed me, I was a little girl then, was that the Tsar was dressed in an old coat, which was all stained. It wasn't even clean. There were no decorations, nor epaulets. Many years have passed. I'm 90 now, but I still remember it. I still remember the Tsar's expression. There was such pain and suffering and tears in his eyes. The family's situation at the Winter Palace was house arrest rather than imprisonment, but it was still a far cry from their previous life. Still, the family retained its humor and humanity. The teacher, Gilliard, wrote of the girls' reaction to a humiliating treatment for the measles from which they had just recovered. The Grand Duchesses have had their heads shaved as a result of their illness. 
When they go out in the park, they wear scarves arranged so as to conceal the fact. Just as I was going to take their photograph, at a sign from Olga, they all suddenly removed their hats. I protested, but they insisted, much amused at the idea of seeing themselves photographed like this. The leaders of the new provisional government were nervous about having the former Tsar so close to the capital. The simplest solution would have been to send the family abroad to one of their European relatives. But they could hardly go to their cousin the Kaiser, with whom Russia was still at war. So the new government requested, and received, asylum in Great Britain for the Romanovs. But the English king George V, the cousin of both Nicholas and Alexandra, was unprepared for the public outcry. Inside England, of course, tempers were running against the Tsar and his German spy wife. All nonsense, of course, she was not a German spy, she was more English than anything else. But that was the situation in England. George V, in 1917, is very worried about the threat to conservatism in general, but to the dynasty in particular, from the socialist movement, from the working class. He doesn't want his dynasty to be associated with the hated Romanovs, let alone the hated and fallen Romanovs. So King George withdrew the offer of asylum. His cousin, the former Tsar, was now an international pariah. I'm certainly not ready to criticize King George for withdrawing an invitation to come to the Tsar. Secondly, I'm sure, and a grandmother used to tell me that, the Tsar never wanted to leave Russia. He would have left only if his wife would have asked him to leave. But there is no record of such a request from Alexandra. For the time being, the family stayed at Tsarskoye Selo. But the world had not stopped. Russia was still at war with Germany, but the Germans had a secret weapon, the banned radical Vladimir Lenin, whom they now sent back to Russia on a sealed train. The Germans knew they could count on a favor from Lenin if he took power. A legend has grown up around his triumphant return to Petrograd's Finland train station. But in fact, there was a scramble to find people to greet him. I met Lenin at the Finland station. It was the second day of Easter. Lenin's sister Maria produced his telegram saying, I will arrive tonight at 11. She said, how are we going to manage to collect people to meet Lenin, to give him a fitting welcome? And they answered, that's all right. The soldiers are on leave, and at the meetings taking place all over the town, they will be informed that Lenin is arriving. Lenin's trick was to say what many wanted to hear, and what the Germans had sent him back to say. Lenin had the populist touch, peace and land for the people, he proclaimed. You soldiers, and there were about 200,000 soldiers in Petrograd, none of you will have to go to the front if you support the Bolsheviks. And they all supported Lenin, who'd want bloody and dirty trenches when it was much better here in the capital. Lenin's true hour of glory was still to come. First, he had to tackle Kerensky, who was becoming a leader of the new provisional government. Lenin's propaganda machine went to work on Kerensky, but Lenin's ultimate focus was on the Romanovs, who had been responsible for the hanging of his older brother years before. Lenin wanted them all dead. Even though the deposed Tsar and his family were becoming a liability, 
the moderate revolutionary Kerensky felt responsible for the Romanov safety. I had the thankless task of telling the former Tsar he would have to move away. The Bolsheviks are after me, I said, and soon they will be after you. Contrary to my expectations, he took the news calmly and expressed his wish to go to the Crimea. Instead, I chose Tobolsk in Siberia, which was without railway communications. I knew that the governor's house was fairly comfortable and could provide decent accommodation for the imperial family. As the sun rose on August the 14th, the moment came for the once imperial family with their many trunks and cases and at least two dozen members of the Tsarist household to leave. It got quite light, we drank tea, and finally at 5.15, Kerensky said we could go. The sunrise that saw us off was beautiful. We left Saske Selo at 6.10 in the morning. The journey into exile was long and slow. Four days in a train, two more on a paddle steamer. On the evening of the 20th of August, they finally reached Tobolsk. Nicholas had once visited the Kremlin here a quarter of a century before. He had stayed in the governor's house, and it was in this very house, renamed Freedom House since the revolution, that the Romanov family were now to be prisoners. We examined everything in the house from bottom to attic. Many rooms have an unattractive view. And then went to the so-called garden. Nasty. The sense of being locked up is much stronger than at Saske Selo. By the late fall of 1917, Lenin and his Bolsheviks were poised to seize power. On November 7th, by the Western calendar, the Bolsheviks headed for the Winter Palace, now the stronghold of Kerensky's seven-month-old government. It is one of Soviet history's most legendary moments. The location is genuine enough, but the film's depiction of the famous storming is remembered differently by some. There was no storming as such. Well, there was a storming, but there was no bloodshed. Because all the young cadets, they were just boys, really. They just threw down their arms and surrendered. Vladimir Antonov Avsienko was in charge of the famous storming of the Winter Palace. My father called it a coup a takeover, and that's why there were practically no casualties. He could have been shot, and his sailors too, but nothing like that happened. The government fell like a ripe pear from the tree. The provisional government was destroyed, but the damage to the palace consisted of chipped paintwork and a broken window. Kerensky managed to flee Petrograd, never to return. Lenin and the Bolsheviks were now the rulers of Russia. Lenin, whose return to Russia had been engineered by Germany, pushed for peace. In one stroke of the pen, he conceded great tracts of the Russian Empire's western borderlands, nearly half a million square miles and more than one-third of the population. Peace was popular enough with the demoralized soldiers, who fraternized with German soldiers at the front, but it split the country. 
In the south, an anti-Bolshevik white army came into being. It was immediately countered by a Bolshevik red army. A civil war was brewing in which the Bolsheviks' main weapon was coercion, the Red Terror. In Tobolsk, Nicholas eventually heard of the disintegration of his Russia. The tutor, Giliard, still part of the household, saw the intensity of the effect it had on him. I then, for the first time, heard the Tsar regret his abdication. It now gave him pain to see that his renunciation had been in vain. I frequently heard Nicholas muttering, disgrace, suicide for Russia, and to think that they called Her Majesty a traitor. The family had now spent more than six months as prisoners in Tobolsk, in the shadow of its ancient Kremlin and cathedral. New, harsher guards had taken over, and Alexandra and her daughters secretly sewed into their bodices all that was left of the Romanov riches, their jewelry. I make everything now. I am knitting stockings for Alexei. His father's trousers are torn and darned, the girl's underlinen all in rags. I'm sad because they are allowed no walks except in front of the house, inside the high fence. But at least they have fresh air, and we are grateful for anything. I would say that the Romanov's fate was sealed from the moment that the Bolsheviks came to power. The new regime seized power in what was a coup d'etat. The Bolshevik regime then went on to sign the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with Germany, and signed away everything that Russia had gained for 300 years. Having done that, civil war was a certainty. And once you had civil war, Lenin and his party were going to react ruthlessly. I think at that point, there was no hope for the Romanovs. They were bound to die. On top of everything, Alexei, now nearly 14 years old, was to suffer another serious bout of hemophilia. He would never walk again. He is frightfully thin and yellow. I sit with him all day. Yesterday, he said to me, Mama, I would like to die. I am not afraid of death, but I am so afraid of what they will do to us here. In late April 1918, the Bolshevik High Command, now established in the Kremlin in Moscow, issued new orders. The Romanovs were told to get ready to leave, but not where they were going. Across the road from the governor's house lived the Tsar's much reduced retinue, including Dr. Bortkin, the family physician, and his daughter Tanya. Shortly before Easter, a small gift arrived for Tanya, and with it, a note. It is dated 1918 and signed O.R. Olga Romanov, Easter 1918. Just a few days before their departure for Ekaterinburg, three months before their death. Christ has risen. My dear Tanya, here are two eggs from all of us. It's very sad we can't all be together. With fondest kisses, Olga Romanov. Under guard, Nicholas and his family were sent on yet another exhausting journey. En route, their train was hijacked by a band of hardened revolutionaries. Their new wardens took them to the town of Ekaterinburg in the Urals. They arrived on April 18, 1918, and were installed in the former house of a merchant named Ipatiev. It was renamed the House of Special Purpose.
Nobody knows for sure whether the family realized their fate. There were rumors of escape plans, but it is now known that they were spread deliberately by the Bolsheviks. Lenin, in his Kremlin citadel, faced enemies on all sides. The White Army was threatening Ekaterinburg, and the German Kaiser, Alexandra's cousin, was now expressing concern for the safety of his relatives. Enter Yakov Yurovsky, the Romanovs' new warden. One summer day, he was seen wandering in the forest. He and his cronies located an abandoned mine shaft. They bought drums of gasoline and sulfuric acid. They arranged for a truck. Back at the Ipatiev house, Alexandra continued to write in a diary which had been given to her by her daughter Tatiana. To my sweet darling mama dear, with my best wishes for a happy new year, may God's blessings be with you and guard you forever. Your own loving girl, Tatiana. The 46-year-old Alexandra dated her diary through to the end of the summer, but the last entry is on July the 16th. Grey morning after lovely sunshine. Tatiana started to read from the prophet Obadiah. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Played Bezik with Nicholas. 10.30 to bed. 15 degrees. At 1.30 a.m. on July 17th, the family was woken up by Yurovsky and told to prepare to move once again. They were led into a small basement room. There, the 11 prisoners, the family and a small retinue, were suddenly confronted by 11 armed men. There had only been time for incoherent exclamations. Both Yurovsky and one of the guards, Medvedev, recorded in legal depositions their versions of what had happened. Pavel Medvedev. All the members of the Tsar's family were lying on the floor, very severely wounded. The blood was running in streams. Yakov Yurovsky. I myself killed Nicholas, point blank. Alexandra Fyodorovna died immediately. Alexei and three of his sisters were still alive. We had to finish them off. We tried to bayonet one of the girls, but the bayonet would not penetrate her corsage. We undressed the girl and found a corset torn in places by bullets through which diamonds could be seen. Pavel Medvedev. The heir to the throne was still alive and mourning a little. Yurovsky fired two or three times at him. Then the air was still. This telegram to the bosses in Moscow announced in a prearranged code that the whole family was dead. Nicholas has been shot and his family sent to a safe place. The bodies of the Romanov family were taken by truck to the mine, hacked to pieces, soaked in sulfuric acid, burned on a bonfire, and then thrown down the shaft. But Yurovsky worried that his efforts had been rather too public. The next night, in deepest secrecy, the fragments of skeleton and burnt flesh were exhumed and buried elsewhere. For half a century, the Romanovs and their mortal remains would disappear.
The White Army took Ekaterinburg within a week of the assassination. They had no doubts about what had happened. And the Tsar's family was not alone. Every Romanov the Bolsheviks could find, they murdered. Nicholas's brother Michael, nine uncles and cousins, and Alexandra's sister Ella, 18 Romanovs in all. For years, it was debated what part, if any, Lenin had played in ordering the execution of Nicholas and his family. Long secret Bolshevik papers have now revealed the following. Lenin, Trotsky, and Sverdlov worked out this very cunning plan, empowering the Yekaterinburg Soviet to liquidate the family, using as a pretext all sorts of fabricated plots, attacks, and attempts to rescue them. And I have documentary proof of this. For example, Goloshokin, head of the Yekaterinburg Soviet, went to Moscow twice just before the killings. Twice he was in Moscow for instructions, for meetings with Lenin, Sverdlov and others. It was all pre-planned. The foul act of annihilating Nicholas II was not accidental. The local Bolsheviks appeared to have carried out the murders on their own initiative. But it now seems clear that it was on orders from Lenin. Lenin took great care, however, to hide the truth. Even from his ambassador to Berlin, Adolf Ioffe. In 1918, when my father was Soviet ambassador in Berlin, he received a communication down the line from Moscow that the former Tsar Nicholas II had been shot. He asked, and what about the family? He got no reply, and somehow the question was hushed up. And when Dzerzhinsky, head of the secret police, passed through Berlin, father leant on him and said, why did you not reply to my queries when everyone was asking me, from the Kaiser down, all Alexander's relatives you know? Dzerzhinsky replied, it was a special order from Lenin. He said, let Yoffa be told nothing. It will be easier for him to lie about it there in Berlin. For over half a century, Lenin and his lies held sway. No one even knew where the remains of the imperial family were buried, until 1979, when years of private and top-secret research pinpointed a certain submerged bridge not far from the original mine. One morning, at the beginning of May, we came here at 6 o'clock when there was no one around. We removed a few planks and immediately, buried not very deep, we found some human remains. There were several of us when we found the remains. We were all in a state of shock. It was terrible. It was really frightening, because the remains were mutilated by sulfuric acid, and the bones were all black and green. This heap of bones filled us with horror. We were lucky in that we found three skulls almost immediately. We covered everything up straight away, but kept the skulls with us, as we wanted to have them identified. Identification was to become the key issue. In 1991, the remains were exhumed yet again, officially. But two skeletons were missing. So were these bones truly those of the last Tsar and his family? The latest DNA analysis would provide the answer by comparing the Romanov bones with tissue from living relatives. Exactly 100 years to the day after the accession of Nicholas II to the Romanov throne, Queen Elizabeth II of Britain visited the Peter and Paul Fortress, traditional burial place of all the other Romanov czars. 
It was the Queen's husband, Prince Philip, one of the closest living relatives of both Nicholas and Alexandra, who gave the crucial blood sample for DNA comparison. After exhaustive testing and squabbling, the results proved, with 99% accuracy, that the remains are indeed those of some of the Romanovs. One daughter and the son have not been accounted for, so rumors of Romanov surviving the assassination live on, however unlikely. Even the DNA results failed to convince the Russian church to consecrate the remains, however, because Nicholas's skull was not tested. They forbade burial until still further tests were complete. <laughs> 